Well, good afternoon. I'm Chris Shearer, member of communications director of the Society of Broadcast Engineers and the co-host of this month's episode of the SBE Web Extra, the SBE chapter of the web. This is a monthly SBE meeting, usually held the third Monday of the month. The SBE is the Association for Broadcast and Multimedia Technology Professionals with about 5,000 members, mostly in the U.S., but also around the world. The SBE Web Extra is sponsored by Catrine. Catrine, unique experience, individual solutions, reliable performance. The host of today's SBE Web Extra is SBE board member Kirk Harnack, who is also the chair of the SBE Social Networking Committee. How you doing, Kirk? Hey, I'm good, Chris. Good to see you and good to see everyone who has tuned in. We've got a good show for you with a very interesting guest. And I just want to mention something about Catrine. I think maybe I mentioned last month and I'll mention it again. I just unboxed uh, a beautiful little Catrine uh, antenna, which is going to be in use at uh, at a new radio station that I'm, I'm part owner of in Mississippi. So glad to have them along as a sponsor. Really good stuff. And it's the kind of stuff that it'll set up 50 years from now. <laughs> it'll look about the same as it as it does brand new. All right. Uh, so with uh, with COVID uh, being here for uh, more than a year, you know, a lot of manufacturers have uh, uh, probably rushed their schedules even up even more to assist broadcasters and content creators in um, in being able to do more remote production and more production in, in interesting ways. Um, and that's, I guess that's going to be a good enough introduction because we've got with us Michael Kronk. Michael is the VP of Advanced Technology at Grass Valley. And so, you know, I'm involved in radio and I love to see what television is doing because they got a lot more things to do than, than radio does in terms of uh, of bringing sources together and, and switching them and doing special effects. And there's a lot going on in, in television production. Michael, welcome in to the SBE Web Extra. Thank you, Kirk. It's great to be here. So, um, Michael, we're going to uh, get a member update from Chris Shear here in just a minute, but maybe you could give us just a couple sentence preview. What are we going to be learning from you about uh, the technologies and techniques uh, going on with Grass Valley? Well, Grass Valley is a very broad based supplier of tools for uh, live production uh, in traditional sense. And, and we've really sought to transform that into what we can do in, in cloud production. Uh, and so we're going to delve into that and 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 what we're about and 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 how that is uh, looking for the future as well. I'm excited to hear about this. I know some of the techniques and and tools available are cloud based. Some are on premises. So we're going to find out about how those work and how they can work together and how. Uh, well, how we can quit stuffing 20 people into a, a TV truck. So that's coming up. <laughs> Chris Shearer, you've got a member update for us. Take it away. Yes, I do. Here is your SBE member update for May 17th, 2021. The annual SBE compensation survey is still open. We need your help in gathering the most accurate data we can. The survey is used to determine sal salary levels and benefits among broadcast and media technology engineers. SBE membership is not required to take the survey and all responses remain anonymous. Take the survey today. Go to sbe.org survey for the link. This year, the SBE launched a new series and webinars by SBE, the 2021 IP Networking Series. The first four parts are, are available on demand. Part five, Cybersecurity Principles and Concept, airs live on May 20th. Wayne Piscina leads the webinars. And later this month on May 27th, we present ANSI TIA 222H Standard and Broadcast Tower Maintenance. The session will introduce the maintenance requirements for broadcast towers per ANSI TIA 222 Revision H, the recognized design standard for tower structures and antennas. For more information on these and all the webinars by SBE, go to sbe.org slash webinars. The next SBE certification exam window at local chapters is June 4 to 14th. That application deadline is passed. The next local chapter exam window after that is in August. Applications to take an exam then are due to the SBE National Office by June 11th. Also remember, if a local chapter exam is not convenient for you or not possible because of COVID restrictions, private proctoring is available. The new SBE Specialist Certification, ATSC-3, is now available. There are a few people who have already added the ATSC-3 Specialist letters to their professional titles. More information on SBE certification is online at sbe.org slash certification. The annual SBE membership drive started March 1st. It runs through May 31st, so there's still some time. The theme this year is add power to your profession. 
Sponsor a new member to join the SBE, and you as a member can benefit as well. You'll be entered into a prize drawing for each new recruit, including a chance to win a trip to the SBE National Meeting, and you can earn a savings on your 2022 SBE dues. Recruit someone today. Get all the details at sbe.org slash drive. And don't forget to renew your own SBE membership. It was due April 1st, so if you're in the grace period and you haven't renewed, you can still renew online at sbe.org slash renew or follow the link button on the homepage. The annual SBE National Awards Program recognizes those who have contributed to the SBE, the industry, or their chapters in a number of categories. Winners will be recognized at the National Awards Program at the SBE National Meeting. Honor your colleagues and chapters by submitting an SBE Award nomination. Nominations are due to the SBE National Office by June 15th. And finally, chapters meeting virtually should still report those meetings to the national office just as you would an in-person meeting. These meetings count toward the minimum five meetings held during the calendar year necessary to qualify for an annual chapter rebate. If you hold your meetings via Zoom, there's a way for the meeting host to export all the attendee information, which simplifies the chapter secretary's task. Chapter leaders, there's a link to the instructions on the SBE website under Chapter Administration. Go to sbe.org slash chapter admin. And that is your SBE member update for May 17th, 2021. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate that. Hey, when we start meeting back sure. in person here in Nashville, I, I want to have you do the member update because yeah, you just get right to it. <laughs> I'd appreciate have to phone it, it in. Le- <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. Uh, well, we're here with uh, Michael Cronk with Grass Valley, the VP of uh, Advanced Technology. And that has uh, to do with um, all the, well, I'll, I'll let him tell it in a minute, but Michael is also the chairman of the Ames Committee and uh, considered to be the father of Grass Valley AMP. That's the Agile Media Production Platform. Michael, welcome back in. And maybe you could t- tell something about this AMP, uh, AMPP. What is that? Yeah, well, Thank you, Kirk. And uh, I'll just uh, slightly correct one one thing. I said that the father of AMP have been involved from the beginning. It's been a fantastic thing. But this was a journey with a lot of different uh, people that contributed. So so I, I can't take uh, singular credit for that. It was a, a, a really uh, very rewarding uh, te- team effort. Um, so AMP, AMP is the Agile Media Processing Platform. And at Grass Valley, four to five years ago, we were looking you know strategic planning and whatnot as as to what do we need to to look for and prepare for and we saw in so many industries how uh, cloud compute and doing everything in software was transforming literally how how we go about you know buying books purchasing music all, all those types of things and video being a higher bandwidth signal that was going to take some time but that was going to work its way out uh into uh, our arenas as well. And we thought, what could we do with the knowledge and expertise that we have in Grass Grass Valley to essentially apply the video live production techniques that we have to, uh, you know, software technologies that are virtualized that could be used in the cloud, could be used on premise. And so we set about doing that and building a platform that as a system could, could handle those needs. Uh, and we're involved in, in a lot of different areas of, of video uh, uh, you know, kind of processing, including play out and networking and all these kind of things. But the toughest thing uh, is really live production in terms of the number of signals that one has to handle and, and, and whatnot. Uh, the latencies, it needs to be low latency, uh, multiple people involved in a production with many operator stations. And so we figured if, if we could solve it for live production, the challenge of doing things in a virtualized world, we could solve it for just about anything in broadcast. And the output of that that effort was the Agile Media Processing Platform. So, um, wow, that's that's a lot to take in and unpack. Um, uh, you know, in, in our own lives, we've been doing more and more things uh, virtually, uh, things that are now based in the cloud. I used to go to my bank every time I needed to deposit a check or get some money out or make a, a transfer from one account to another. I haven't been to my bank in probably two or three years now. Um, except to make one withdrawal, one big withdrawal. But, uh, you, you know, we do all this stuff in the cloud, including making check deposits, taking pictures. We trade uh, stocks uh, on, online. We order all kinds of things online. And so I always figured it had to come where we could do audio production in the cloud and, and now video production in the cloud. Um, this sounds like a lot of challenge, though, as you mentioned, high high bandwidth, a lot of different sources coming in. Um, maybe you could... Uh, d- 
talk to me first of all about kind of setting this up. COVID started a little over a year ago, and a lot of corporations were were you know put down the edict. Okay, everybody out of the building or just one or two people start working from home. We've had some shows uh, on this channel about. Uh, doing work from home, even producing live local newscasts from home. Um, how did COVID uh, change your trajectory with uh, with the Agile Media Processing Platform? Yeah, that's a great question. So as I alluded to, we really started thinking and planning about addressing this four to five years ago. So literally had absolutely no idea that that something like COVID was was coming our way. Um, and we were set to our, our first on-air event with with AMP uh, was with an esports organization, Blizzard Entertainment, one of the larger ones. Uh, and and they were having events in arenas, so they'd have five, ten thousand fans go into an arena. They would roll a typical OB truck, normal production, and produce the program out, both audio and video from that. And then they were going to shoot that to the cloud, and we were going to do the master control function. So. Uh, adding additional languages and, and branding for different distribution points, that, that type of thing. Um, and so that was what we were doing. And, and that, that first event was in February of, of 2020. And so then fast forward, you know, about a month and a half later, uh, and all of a sudden, you know, can't fly anymore, you know, uh, you know, 12, two, two weeks to stop the spread or all that, that, all that stuff is going on and people didn't realize what an impact this was going to be. And so we then um, had to rapidly pivot because we had focused on master control. Well, master control, the audio functionality, uh, what you need to do with video effects is completely different, or I guess I should say more simpler than what you have to do if you go uh, to actually do a live production. But all of a sudden our customers were like, well, we can't do productions anymore, so we need something to, to do there. And we had always intended to, to focus at live production, but our timeline was to get there towards the end of 2020, not March. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we accelerated some things. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think Blizzard Entertainment is an example. They were they were off air. They, they just kind of canceled what they were doing for two weeks. But two weeks later, at the end of March, they got back on the air. They started doing shows. Um, and they were doing it all completely in the cloud and every operator was at their home, producers, directors, you know, all that was just people on comms talking to each other um, and pressing buttons on computers that was producing video in a, a live production show in the in the cloud. Wow. Uh, and I, I think some of us have seen YouTube videos of, of uh, uh, television uh, technical directors uh, and producers and directors being in their homes watching on a on a multi-screen maybe it was a zoom call that that had a bunch of screens on it um uh, I, to me this is absolutely fantastically amazing especially how you deal with the the latency the latencies involved uh, I have enough latency in audio but you know video takes time to crunch and and send over the over the internet talk to me about latencies and and how you guys have how your customers have dealt with it and how you have gotten latencies down as low as as possible yeah um one of the uh adages that that we have is we have to kind of recognize the natural laws in the world right so the adage is you, you can't cheat physics uh but mm -hmm. but you can you can manage it and that that has to do very much uh with latency there's a speed of light over fiber that you know you just can't cheat the longer further are you away you, you just have to deal with that um, but we can put timestamps on every, every signal. And so if they arrive at different times in the cloud, we can, uh, can align them. We can mm -hmm. present all those signals to uh, TDs and replay operators and everybody else on a multi-viewer where all those uh, signals are in sync. And because control commands can travel, they're smaller, so it doesn't take as, as much latency to get those to the cloud. We can, we can create an experience. So when the operators on looking at their multi-viewer on a switcher and they press a button, that that experience is like they were in the other room. You know, there's a human perception. I push a button and it's still, it's like 60 to 100 milliseconds before I start to feel, hey, that's a little sluggish. Mm -hmm. uh, and and yeah. so if we stay within those time constants for the control, we can give a great experience. Uh, then, but you have, you have things where you've got, commentators that aren't at the game right so they've got to get a send a feed to a cloud send it back to them they've got to 
call the game, you know, touchdown or goal or whatever the, the sport is. And then that audio has to be married up with the other program sound that's, that's, that's being mixed. So uh, knowing how to delay that uh, efficiently and that this whole area is, is a bunch of technology that we call intelligent time management that, that we've built inherently in the system that allows us, uh, it really anybody to set this up in a, in a way that isn't complex uh, and allows you to pull off, off the production. But there is delay as you send stuff to the to the the cloud, right? If we were all in the same room, and you send, and we had some, you know, like an iMag application where you have video screens in the place with, say, there's a corporate meeting, uh, to to magnify the speaker and things like that. You send that signal to the cloud and back. You're gonna people in the room are gonna notice the delay, right? So when you have that feedback loop, you've you've got to be careful because you can't cheat fi physics. Uh, but there's a lot of techniques in in order to to manage it, and that's the exciting part. Is cracking that nut allowed us to open a whole bunch of of doors for people to see? Hey, I really can do more in the cloud or re remotely, uh, and 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 do a high quality production. I'm going to ask you a couple of technical questions or things I'm curious about. You you mentioned um, timestamps on the video on the packets, I assume. Um, does this imply that if you've got uh, a number of different cameras in different locations at a large event, maybe it's a maybe it's a golf uh, a golf event or just something large, a, a, a sports yeah. car, Formula One, that kind of thing, does that imply that every camera or every camera location needs to have I don't know GPS uh, to put proper timestamps on everything? How how does the how do you get the right timestamps on on the source material? Yeah, uh, we we found that. Um, you know, there's there's two kind of time source methods. There's there's PTP, which is extremely accurate, um, mm. but very also very different to support in the cloud. Uh, and then there's NTP, which is less accurate, but it's still a good NTP system that has a GPS lock is you know plus or minus five milliseconds, which you think of a frame of a video is you know sixteen milliseconds. So I can align the the video frame and get you know clo close enough. Um, so yes, to, to, to align sources, you need a time source that is locked to something like GPS. Um, and then you need that in, in the signal that doesn't have to be at the, the camera itself. That can be at the encoder that's in the truck on the golf mm -hmm. course. Um, but, but you do need that. Otherwise, you know, uh, internet delays when thing, you know, different hops for different signals and all of a sudden you're, you're you got different frames out and. And it's, you know, for a production crew, those differences, if they're there, make it jarring, right? It's, it's, it's really hard to cut a show when you're not sure that this frame aligns with the other frame you're seeing on the multi-viewer. Um, well, that brings me to add, you mentioned different cameras or maybe even a encoder. Uh, does this imply that, let's say you have a really large event, like, like a Formula One race, it's spread over a large area. Are, are, are people typically bringing each camera feed back into the cloud or to a central location? Or are they pre-switching yeah. something there on site? Well, and, and this gets to, I think you alluded to in, in the opening, that this technology be, can, can be used in the cloud or on, on premise. Uh, the way AMP works is, is there is a, a service, there's a cloud aspect that we send control messages and, and data and allows us to literally do a production kind of all over the world. But we essentially, we attach compute nodes to that orchestration layer, if you will, and those compute nodes can live anywhere. Uh, they can be an EC2 instance in AWS. They can be in Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud. Um, they can be a caught server, you know, a commodity off the shelf hardware from a Dell or an HP uh, on premise in an OB van and a, a truck at a golf course. Uh, and the, the applications uh, for video switching and replay and creating multi-viewers and monitoring. Those are all separate microservices that can be spun up globally mm -hmm. across any of those. So, so we can put the processing where it makes sense. That, that example where I talked about, you know, a, a corporate conference where you've got a speaker and maybe because there's maybe a thousand people in this big, you know, hotel conference room, they have some, you know, magnification of, of uh, just taking a camera shot of, of the speakers. So they can see them a little bit with more detail. That you can't have a lot of delay in, so locate the processing in the room, right? We can, we can do that. And so um, it is very flexible that way. 
so thinking about uh, the difference in remote production of uh, of a big event, maybe a music festival, uh, or versus sports, whether it's in a stadium, a fixed, you know, all the cameras are kind of pointing down at the same place, uh, tennis, soccer, football, baseball, versus a, a, a larger event, versus doing something like um, local news. If you if you wanted to cloudify your local news production, what are some of the the different techniques or the different things you really got to think about for each different kind of of event? Yeah, no, that's a good question, and and uh, it it seems daunting, but it but there's actually just a few simple principles that that make sense. For, first of all, um, the the first question is where are my input sources coming from? Right, because that establishes if they're not where I think I want to process them, I need to get them from point A to point B. And so, a lot of times, if if your sources are, you know, different cameras in a, at a at a golf course, maybe I want to locate processing there, um, so I don't have to send them. Um, if my or if there's a lot of cameras, like you said, Formula One or golf are examples of a lot of cameras. Um, if I want to do, really do this in the cloud for some reason. I've got to figure out how to get them all to the cloud, right? So I've got to have a lot of encoders. Um, uh, some some events though, there's a lot lot less cameras. You know, uh, down to like a you know a radio talk show with a video component could have three to four cameras. That that may be pretty easy to get get to the cloud. So uh, and it depends on what what pipes. You know, a modern um, stadium for any professional sports league generally has some kind of 10 gig link up into a, a cloud. Uh, and and so that's a lot easier than in the middle of nowhere on a golf course, right? Where you, you got to set set all this stuff up. Um, so so where where are my import sources coming from? Uh, and then I think the next question is where am I going to, right? If I'm if if my sources are coming into my fixed facility, and it's going to go out to drive an antenna that I you know send the signal to the transmitter from my fixed facility. I, going all the way up to the cloud and back probably doesn't make a lot of sense. If my output is YouTube or Twitch or, or some type of OTT service, well, maybe it does make sense to, to, to be in the cloud. And then the last question is that the third component, you've got inputs, sources, destinations, and then processing. Where, where does it make sense to put the processing? Um, We've had, you know, as an example, uh, at a, a live event we did with uh, a number of live events we did with EA Sports, but one of them in particular, uh, it was a European show of the FIFA, their their FIFA uh, esports game, and it was the European qualifier. They kind of mimicked the World Cup qualifying, so they had over twenty sources coming in from Europe, uh, but the TD was based in Sacramento, California, and so they said, right, "We'll just spin up some computer in." AWS in Northern Virginia, it's kind of halfway. We'll, we'll mm -hmm. contribute those 20 plus signals to AWS Northern Virginia. Um, the Sacramento person will sit on a, a Grass Valley K-frame switcher panel that they had in their room, uh, but the buttons he pushed would go send send control signals to Northern Virginia and he'd, and he'd, and he'd cut the show that way. So it depends. In, in that example, the, uh, EA Sports, uh, their primary distribution are things like Twitch and YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. They were mm -hmm. already all over the place, you know, people in Germany, people in Italy, people in the UK. So there wasn't a central place where all the sources was, so just send them to the cloud. Um, and, and that makes a lot of sense. In other cases where resources are already coming to the facility, it might make sense to just do it in the facility. So, well, this question has crossed my mind, and I, I, I'm guessing this is something that you guys do. So, let's say that I'm the TD, and I'm I'm punching up different sources, and some things, some sources come right into me to come into my facility. They're local to me in some way or another, uh, and if I push those buttons, maybe that signal's not even leaving my facility. It's just switching stuff right there. But I have other things that are come that 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 are being aggregated or switched in, in a data center somewhere. And so I want to push those buttons. It's making the switch, you know, miles and miles away somewhere else. But I don't really know the difference. I mean, yeah, I, I kind of know where they are. But, uh, you know, in my in the final production, it doesn't matter where these sources are or where the switching is actually occurring. Is that something that that AMP does? Is, is that a technique that's, that can be used? Well, there's there are um, certainly re requests for that. And that's certainly something where uh, 
looking to do, whereas you, you have essentially two different processing nodes in two different places, and I push a button on mm -hmm. one, and I figure out how to combine those. Uh, there's some complexities about that, but the beauty of, of it being software and the modern communication techniques is we have the information to, to kind of build that out. I'd say the more uh, prevalent an example is I may have some local sources, and let, let's say that I've got you know, 20 sources that are coming from elsewhere and they're being aggregated in, in the cloud and I'm doing switching in the cloud and I got four local sources. Like I can send them to the cloud. As, as a TD, I see a multi-viewer with those sources all in the cloud. That multi-viewer, those sources are aligned. If I push a button, I know which which decision I'm making in, in time versus with respect to that multi-viewer. And so mm. kind of sending them to one place, providing a multi-viewer from the place where the switcher is, is a is a tried and true method but there there are some pretty wild and innovative ways to do things beyond that 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 we're looking forward to so uh in a few minutes i'm going to ask you about uh you know what what disciplines that people that engineers need to think about learning about if they don't already know well, i'll hold that one for a little bit later um talk to me about, uh, with, with with video audio going into cloud or going into your on-prem or both uh, and the compute power required in the cloud. Talk to me a little bit, little bit about costs. Is this kind of cloud yeah. production appropriate for 24 seven operation or just for special events? What, what begins to make sense in, in this world? Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic uh, question. So, um, again, it's all, um, there's a lot of different levers in the cost equation and, and I think what AMP gives you is is the flexibility to have a few few more levels, but you still have to uh, customers of AMP still sit down and put it, things in a spreadsheet and and figure out what their their costs will be. Um, so cloud compute in general um, is expensive. It's it's if you will, it's more of a rental model, right? I can buy on demand. I can sign up. I can spin something up, and I'm charged per the hour. Uh, for for what that is, it's a you know it's a SaaS consumption model, mm -hmm. um, and so typically, um, with the types of compute instances that we use, and we use compute instances that have GPUs as well as CPU, um, just mm -hmm. because of the GPUs can be very uh, efficient at some of the video processing that we have to do. Uh, that typically, I could go to a public cloud vendor, and af if I just left. If it paid on demand and I left that thing on for three to four months, at about that time, I could probably justify buying an equivalent server from a Dell or an HP with the graphics card and I'd own it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. does that make one better or worse than that? Well, it depends on what you're trying to do. If I'm, if I'm doing a, a one day event, just the way I don't buy a, I don't buy a car when I go to Hawaii, if I get to go to Hawaii again someday, <laughs> um, I, I rent a car cause it's only for a few days in, but I would never go home to where I live near Portland, Oregon. And instead of buying a car, just rent one for five years. Right. So it's a different profile. So, so use the cloud where that, that makes sense. The cloud also has things called reserved in instances. So if you know, you're going to, use it 24 by seven, you commit to that for a one year or a three year term, you get a, a better deal. So, so there's factors like that. Um, but if you're going 24 by seven and you know you are, it might make sense to, you know, build up how many of your servers you need and do it, do it that way. It really, really depends and you have to work through the economics. It's just now that you have, you have the opportunity to compare those things and actually do any one of them the software, the system, how it works stays the same independent of that choice. Oh, wow. It does sound like a decision matrix that that uh, a person would, would need to figure out. How much of this do I do in the cloud, if any, or all of it? And how much do I do on-prem? Uh, do I have the bandwidth coming in? Because you know, we know cloud has lots of bandwidth, typically. That's what they do. Uh, it, 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 does. it does seem like a like a decision matrix that's got to got to be worked out. Can you can you guys help out with that? If a, if a TV station or a, a production company is looking to to really get this figured out? Abs absolutely. We have a, a a team of people now called Solutions Architects that sit down and and uh, you know this is all new for all of us. And so we as as we've worked with more and more customers, we've we've built up and understood you know some some potential approaches and and we can talk talk to people about them and consult and 
you know, it's not a one size fit all, but, but you've got a lot of levers to, to pull. I, th I think as time goes on, we'll start to get a better better feel for this. You know, we didn't used to have solutions architects. You, you'd buy a box, you'd put it in your plant, you'd screw it in your rack, and you know, and you'd use it. And then right. you didn't have to figure out. Well, let's see, do I rent it? Do I do I have it in the cloud somewhere and just have the software in in the cloud? Um, so, th um, so you're an international company. You sell to uh, TV production all over the world. I know that um, uh, manufacturers of all different stripes, including broadcast equipment manufacturers, sometimes uh, it's difficult to um, economically get equipment into other countries. Some countries have very high mm. import tariffs, right? And uh, and right. I understand that typically when you're dealing with intellectual property like software, um, that those tariffs are either don't exist or they're kind of hard to implement. Uh, how how does a business model uh, work out better in some countries? And maybe I use Brazil as, as an example. It just always seemed like Brazil had pretty high import tariffs. Uh, maybe India yeah. would, would would be another one. Does this model of doing things in the cloud change the economic uh, economics of of hardware versus uh, services in the cloud? It it certainly does, and in, in in those countries, and it and it can in a lot of facets. And you know. I, we just talked about you know cost of cloud compute versus COTS, and I did a very simplistic uh, comparison. But there's some things when you buy COTS compute that um, are, are also there, right? If if I need to move it, I need to ship it from point A to point B. Um, and so it's it's not just a, a you know one one factor in in the equation. That for that same COTS compute, I need real estate. I need to pay the electric bill for my HAVC. I need to have HAVC. I need people to support and maintain that that technological platform. Whereas if I go to a pu public cloud vendor, that's all taking care of me. And and also I don't I don't have to worry about obsolescence because usually with computers in about three years I got to buy a new one because you know there's there's something bigger, better, faster. <laughs> uh, warranties go out, all, the, all those kind of things. So it's those types of costs and the the amount I can save on travel that, you know, as we work with broadcasters, those are all factors that, that they're factoring in. And, and that's why I think there's actually a, quite a few that are saying, you know, for these things, I think we need to go to the cloud because it isn't just a straight on uh, compare. It really is a total cost of ownership type of analysis. Let's get back to that uh, question about disciplines. When when you guys are helping, when one of your uh, what you call solutions architects is working with a content creator, whether it's TV station, network, uh, some some entity like that, uh, what kind of a technical point person do you, do you need to deal with? What what skills does your customer need to have in order for this to come together and and work well? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, a fantastic question. The the design goal of, of AMP, I, I think, is is that we're we're making the system such that if you are a broadcast engineer that understands you know video and audio, and is used to you know specking what a you know production control room looks like and building it out, that you can very easily uh, you know get into AMP and and, and use it, um, but. What we're doing when we do that is is we're hiding a lot of uh, the the complexity and and the new kind of technology, right? So uh, typically, uh, if you if you don't have AMP and you're just going to take software and and do what they call a lift and shift, so load it in a virtual machine in the cloud and stick it together with other virtual mach machines, then you need somebody with IT skills. You need somebody that's um, probably understands uh, DevOps, can write a little bit of code and write scripts to automate how things come together and do a bunch of integration. And so it, it, it really becomes um, an IT project. What we've done in AMP um, with that orchestration layer that I alluded to is we've we've done all that work. And so I, I, I log in, I get an account and I have this tool, it's called Resource Manager, and I can literally do this thing called add workload. And when you add a workload, you can add a switcher, you can add a multi-viewer, and so we make we try and make the process such that if I'm a broadcast engineer, I think about the products I normally think about if I'm building a production control room. I talk to the the people that are you know the producers and whatnot. How big of a switcher do I need? What what kind of audio mixer do I need? What what multi viewers you know do I need replay? You go through all that. You spec the system. What what's graphics going to be? I can just add those as as separate apps. And then then what do I do? Well. They, 
that comes to me in a bunch of boxes and crates, and I got to take them out of the box, rack it up, power it up, but then I got to connect it to a router, um, and I need to configure those devices. So the act of configuring um, is, you know, I have to pick, is it going to be 720p or 1080i? Uh, that that same process is there, but it, it just can happen faster um, because it's software and we can recall things pretty easily. Um, and then I route signals together. Uh, we have the, you within AMP, you can take the inputs or outputs of these various applications and route them to each other um, the same way you would in a facility. Uh, and then the last step is I create operator interfaces. The graphics operator sits down in front of tools that they need. So everybody needs intercoms. So there's, you know, you need that. Uh, but then there's, you need monitoring, but the actual control surface is made for the graphics operator. You don't, you don't sit the graphics operator in front of a switcher panel. They don't need that. That would be a distraction. So we're, there's a technique to build, very easily build kind of interfaces that are the right screens for each operator so that you can give them as a single uh, web page really that they they look at and, and and react to. So by doing it that way, we're trying to make it as as easy as possible for broadcast en engineers. I think you know in terms of running and monitoring the system, um, you know one of the the main things is I'm constantly sending signals from ground to cloud, uh, cloud to ground via things like formats such as SRT and and RTP, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm looking for packet drops, and, and and so we provide a lot of diagnostics and monitoring tools to to know kind of where I am in the system block diagram. Um, so so knowing um, you know those protocols and and you know what the errors mean if you get an error, um, th there is some education. I don't mean to say it's not. There's no education, but we've tried to to make it such that if you have a broadcast knowledge, you you can pick it up. Um, but again, there's a lot of work under the hood to abstract out all the the new bits when we do that. <laughs> I was, I, you, you talked about adding a switcher, adding a film, a, a multi-viewer. Of course, my mind went to, I want to add a film. <laughs> yeah, I want to add sure. a projector to this. It's not going to work in the cloud, is it? Um, I wanted to ask you about- Or a uh, camera. Or Yeah, yeah, or a camera, sure. Um, I want to ask you about infrastructure uh, that, that a content creator is going to have to have. Um, it sounds like you've done these with uh, people working from home and using ordinary home-based internet, the better, the better. Uh, if it's fi fiber, terrific. You know, probably DSL yeah. isn't going to do you a whole lot of good. W what, what sort of infrastructure are, do people need to be thinking about where uh, for this? We've, we've talked about at the venues, you, you might need all kinds of yeah. uh, bandwidth, right? But how do you advise people about this? Yeah, so um, our our monitoring technology um, usually for you know something you could put on a on a big TV is HD quality and and see all all your various uh, pips uh, very very well. That that's typically four to five megabits per second down, mm -hmm. um, and you can literally switch the sh uh, show with not much bandwidth up because it's just it's really just control signals. So at a base level, if I'm an operator that's interacting with the system, if I have, you know, with some headbound 10 megabits per second down or 15 megabits per second down, I'm going to be just just fine, which isn't a lot of bandwidth these days. Um, if I'm contributing um, and I want to do, a, you know, a high quality broadcast signal with a good, this is broadcast quality encode, so not not necessarily like a Zoom or something like that, because you can do less with those types of technologies. But a really good signal with a with a proper camera, uh, typically we encode those anywhere from you know 10 to 15 to 20 megabits per second, either HEVC or H.264. And so in that case, you'd want to you know that signal if it's 20, you want some headband, call it 30, you need 30 for that, plus your flow. Uh, so then then you're looking at you know 30 megabits per second up, um, which still isn't that that much the more you know the more the merrier but that's kind of a minimum uh requirement and if you have less there's there's ways to you know look at a lower quality signal that kind of thing but it, that's not a lot of bandwidth these days uh to to get to somebody's you know home yeah exactly yeah uh so well you've, you've architected this thing that you call amp 
Uh, again, that we that's agile media processing platform. But no, no company, no broadcast equipment manufacturer makes everything that somebody would need. So I, you guys have partnered with a few other companies or acquired some other companies. Uh, my employer, Telus Alliance, uh, I think you're partnering with us for some some technology. I'm not sure I should say what it is right now, but we're working together a bit. What are some of the other acquisitions yep. or partnerships that you guys are, are doing at Grass Valley to help make this a whole package? Yeah, no, that's a, a great, great point. Um, so I, I think overall, I you know, Grass Valley is a pretty broad supplier uh, to, to your point. And, and we've gotten there because uh, there, there's Grass Valley, uh, Sam or Snell uh, Media, Miranda are just a few. There's probably been 20 acquisitions over the last, you know, 30, 30 years. So this, we're this amalgamation that has a wide range of, of, of product. That being said, you're absolutely right, Kirk. I mean, there's there's no way for any one company to provide the solution, nor do I think uh, the broadcast community want that, right? They they appreciate the multi-vendor nat nature of it, the ability to work with, with multiple people to build a solution. And so uh, our kind of highest level strategic commitment with AMP really is actually uh, to develop uh, alliances. We call this, uh, our vision for that is what we call the, the GV Media Universe which is an ecosystem that is solving the customer challenges um, today and, and for, for tomorrow. And, and so partners is a, a very, very important uh, part of that. And as you mentioned, uh, we're doing some exciting work with uh, the TELUS Alliance that we're probably not able to talk about in, in specific yet, um, but, but, but others as well. Uh, the, the vision and the, and the, is, is for a seamless experience for the customer. So I can select the apps that I need. I understand the economic model. Technically, they just work together um, and, and that we're solving collectively as a broader community uh, the, the overall problems. And, and that's where I, I would say uh, the majority of our effort is in is to develop that e ecosystem. And it's we're early in that, uh, but that's gonna grow uh, tremendously, I believe, over the next couple of years. And we're very excited about it because you're absolutely right. So uh, what's next? The AI on-screen talent? <laughs> well, I, well you, you cannot be replaced. But, <laughs> but uh, I mean, AI is, well, actually, uh, you Kirk know, once can you... be replaced, but specifically. <laughs> I can oh, be okay. replaced, no, no all doubt. Right. <laughs> so, all right. Um, I'm actually not real. I'm just a Borg that's, you know, <laughs> saying no. I, um, yeah, so as you bring things to, to the cloud, there's a lot of technologies in terms of big data that 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 you have all this information, and so people say, "Well, how do how do we use that?" I and I think that that's something that you know we're interested in. Obviously, the big you know major cloud providers and the you know the Googles and the Amazons and the Microsofts of the world uh, are all into that. And I think there's some things with AI that are that are super useful, and we're excited about them. I don't see. Uh, you get replaced anytime in their futures as much as maybe some other people might want that or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, oh gosh, I had the question on the tip of my tongue and now I've forgotten what it was. Tell you what, uh, uh, Michael, let me give you an opportunity. Anything that we haven't asked you about yet or anything you haven't gotten to, to say about the technology, the techniques, about the AMP uh, platform, uh, anything you want to wrap up with? Well, I just, just to say that, um, you know, it's, it's been a very exciting, uh, Right, I've done a lot of things in in, in my career, and, and this has been a, a very satisfying thing because I think it really is uh, solving a problem, and it's going to make mm -hmm. our industry more nimble, more agile, a, able to kind of uh, face face the future. Uh, and it's it's gotten a lot lot of uh, interest in, in in traction. So I'm excited to for the future to work with the broader community to, to figure out, you know new ways of using and things like that. We see the technology both expanding, I, I guess you'd say um, down market in the sense of, hey, we can apply this to some simpler types of shows and 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 make it more affordable to do things in in non, you know, kind of big network broadcasting applications. Um, but we're also kind of pushing the envelope in the, you know, the size of show that we can do and things like that. So, um, you know, once you get software that, um, scales very well, then you can put the right amount of compute underneath it. And that amount of compute is both expanding and getting 
uh, less expensive all the time. Um, I think it's going to uh, enable us to, to, to broaden uh, the scope of what we can tackle. We actually have a follow-up question from our producer, Suncast. He's asking about video codecs. And uh, one of the interesting things, uh, I started out uh, my career in broadcast equipment manufacturing working for a company that that used audio codecs. But then, uh, because then audio coding uh, technology was cheaper than hard drive technology. And we're getting to, you know, we, we as we move forward in, in technology, bandwidth may become cheaper than video coding technology but that being said yeah. uh talk to me about the future of video codecs versus the expansion of of uh bandwidth out there from any place in the world any place in the, in the world will code codecs continue to have a, a big role will they need to be better and better and squeeze more hd into a smaller and smaller space kind of what, what what's the pressure in codec development these days yeah i i, I think I think there's going to be a continuum because there's so many different use cases and people have varying access to bandwidth. You know, like, like for example, if you're talking about a 10 gig link directly from a stadium to the cloud, well, if, you've, if I've got 10 gigs worth of link, I, I can think about not having to either compress at all, depending on the number of signals or at, at least, you know, compressing more lightly. Um, but if my last mile is, you know, one megabit per second, I've got a totally different, um, you know, calculus and, and those, those bandwidths do vary depending on application and, and the last mile is a factor. Um, and, and so I, I see the need for codecs for, for a long, long time. I think, you know, as a sweet spot for contribution quality today over the public internet that, that people, you know, are doing, if they don't have some kind of bigger, you know, pipe, um, you know, typically we're, you know, 20, maybe max 40 megabits per second. That's still a lot of megabits per second, but if I've got a gig link, um, I can fit quite a bit in there. So, um, I think that's true. I think it's also true, you know, uh, even, even for audio, we say, well, you know, audio is less bandwidth than, than video, but, you know, sending PCM audio to the cloud can, can, Take quite a bit, and I, I think audio codecs over over time, you know, MP3, AC, AC, they were all all there. I think typically uh, the audio codec of choice when we're on the our Zoom calls or our Microsoft Teams calls uh, with each other is a, a codec called Opus, and Opus mm -hmm. can be set to have a packet latency of, of five milliseconds, which is pretty darn slow. Which is why we can have fairly uh, natural conversations despite the fact that we're talking across oceans to each other. So even audio codecs have, have progressed over time. I think video codecs will continue to. And, and yes, at the higher end you go, where there's lots and lots of bandwidth, uh, you know, uncompressed will become uh, more of a factor. But I do think it's a, a continuum. Um, and, I, and I think that solutions need to be able to kind of navigate across that continuum Otherwise, you get stuck into I can only do you know work for this application, but I can't work for you know application B versus application A. Oh, I know a question that popped up in my head is uh, that about um, quality monitoring. If you're at the other end of a codec, uh, are, are we uh, are we still doing camera shading? You know, based on the best monitor we can get our hands on, do codecs affect what uh, technicians or engineers with their decisions about? camera quality or exposure or sh shading, if you will. How does yeah. that play into the codec world? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, and, and you know, another thing is, as we go and vi start doing more and more, you know, HDR broadcasts, um, I need more bits and more color space, right? So mm. most broadcast plants, SDI are, are 422. Um, but some of the codecs that are the most efficient in terms of getting things to the cloud are 420. So I'm taking half of my chroma information and dropping it on the floor when I when I encode it. Yeah. So if I'm doing camera shading, um, I I want I want those bits back. I I want to make sure I'm doing at least a 10 bit encode instead of an 8 bit encode. Uh, and I and I want whatever I'm doing uh, to control the shading. I want to make a tweak and see the response. I can't have a big rubber band effect where I make a change and then I have to wait, you know, a half a second to see what that is. And so uh, codec choice and how much latency there is in the codec, all those things uh, work into it. So depending on the application, 
um, you may need a different codec or a different codec setting. And that, that just goes to show you that's one example of how, you know, this, this world where just there's going to be this one codec to rule them all just isn't going to happen because there's just so many varied uh, needs and, and requirements. I want to ask my uh, co-host, uh, Chris Shearer, to pop back in and see, uh, Chris, uh, you've been following this. Do you have any questions yourself, maybe on the audio side of things? What? <laughs> what? I'm no. kind of in a daze. This is a lot. Yeah, I'm the audio guy. So here I am kind of holding on for dear life, trying to trying to, to, to get a hold of some of this. Um, actually, I guess there's kind of one thing that popped in my mind. I mean, we're, we're kind of early in the... Um, the cloud-based production in some ways. I mean, yeah, we've been doing it for a little while, but uh, in a high quality sense, we're kind of early. We meant, we talked about the lease rent owning prospect. Um, and I would say, I guess to me, renting or leasing right now has the advantage that you're not buying into something that's going to become obsolete prematurely. You're leaving that to somebody else, basically. So you get the advantage of the latest toys and goodies today. But later on, when some advances happen, you're not stuck with what becomes quickly a, an obsolete dinosaur piece of equipment. Um, you think that's a fair assessment? And if so, is there, you know, I mean, this is total crystal ball, but is there a point where you think we might kind of pass that hurdle a little bit um, and, and overcome the uh, premature obsolescence point? Well, yeah, um, I think it's completely fair in one angle. On another angle, though, there's there's another aspect of it to consider, and that is if I'm working in the cloud, I'm usually working in software. Um, and the modern techniques for deploying software in the cloud, there's this thing called a CICD pipeline. That stands for continuous integration slash continuous deployment. And so at Grass Valley, as an example with AMP, um, we are sometimes pushing updates um, once a week, um, adding adding features, doing doing things to the apps. Um, so unlike a uh, where you make a like a capex a, a, a lifetime subscription or perpetual license to a a piece of software, and you buy it and you might get an access to an upgrade, but then they're gonna kind of stick you for maybe an upgrade charge or something like that. And then you got to go find the upgrade and download the upgrade and make sure it's compatible with your machine. Um, you're getting this kind of continuous flow um, of, of information. Uh, so that it, the, the chance of obsolescence with that is a bit less, um, but to your point, you're, you're spot on. So I, I can, I can start um, doing more of a page you go as consumption. If, if I really like what I, have well then maybe I can trans transition to another model which is I'll I'll take out a one or three year subscription to the software because I know it's going to be um, what what I ne need and I see that they're continuous updating so you can you can kind of ease into it right you can you can rent that car drive it around and say I, I like that rental so much um, I I can buy it so you, it, it is a good way to ease into it absolutely. CI CD pipeline. That's a whole boy. There's an article I'm going to be reading, man. That's a, that, that's good information. Uh, you know what? Uh, th th this whole explanation of, uh, of, of this agile, um, media processing platform makes me, makes me think of an analogy that Dr. Albert Einstein made when he was explaining radio. And, and if I, I could change it to explain amp, uh, amp is like having a production facility, either a facility or a truck. Let's call it a truck for a minute, a truck with video switching, with uh, servers for storage and instant playback, uh, uh, it, uh, slow motion playback, instant replay machines, audio, audio mixing, encoding for the distribution channels. It's like a truck having all those things, except there is no truck. <laughs> so that, yeah, that's, yeah, I, it, it has that power and capability or there is no building. Now, you know, I, that that being said, there's a yeah. lot of applications for trucks. And, and the, the one thing we can't vaporize is a camera and a lens. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and so it's it's a new and different model that is is another kind of tool that, that people have to think about. Well, how do how do I produce what I need to produce in a cost effective manner that delights my audience? Um, but it in in the extreme, yeah, it would 
you know, there would be none of that other stuff, but we know that there are buildings, there are people, there are offices. Um, that, I don't think that's going away any anytime soon, but it does give you another option to think about next time. How do, how do I, how do I do this? What, what makes sense um, given the tools that we have? I like that last thing that you said though. Uh, what is our goal here? We want to produce content that delights our audience. And that's really what we're what we're trying to do. And the tools that do that, yeah. it, it it not that it doesn't matter where they are or what they are. We just want the most efficient tools that make sense. And especially in a world where maybe not everybody has to show up at the venue in order to get get this produced. And we've learned that that we don't always have to do that. Yeah, I mean, think think if if I'm an A A list um, replay operator, uh, and I get a and I get a gig uh, in in the you know pre-COVID world, what do I have to do? Well, I, I've got to hop on a plane. I, I've got to fly over here, fly over there. I I could actually do more shows, maybe with different broadcasters, get paid more if I want to or not, live where I want to live, um, improve my quality of life, and maybe make more money. You know, it, it's maybe that's not for everybody, but now that kind of thing is 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 possible because the technology allows it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Hey, I've got a good friend who was a Chiron operator for Monday Night Football for years. And man, he was on the road, you know, obviously Monday nights, but he was on, on the road a lot. Yeah. And this does give us options. Uh, we're going to wrap it up. Michael, thank you so very much. Michael Kronk is the VP of Advanced Technology over at Grass Valley, a company that uh, obviously is on the forefront with uh, your acquisitions and your partnerships of uh, making it, uh, uh, you know, bringing up to speed uh, uh, into the modern era how we can produce video content and audio to go with it. Michael, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much, Kurt. All right. Chris here, I want to thank you for uh, being here, the co-host and the member update. Any, any last words from you, Chris? Um, I've got a lot of catching up to do. I know I'm going to watch the replay of this a few times <laughs> just to figure it all out. Uh, it's not that it's that hard. It's just there was a lot to take in. So um, good job as always. And again, I also thanks, uh, thanks to Mike for being with us this afternoon. All right. Well, Chris, I think we hand it back to you to uh, take us out and, uh, and wrap us all up. Thanks again, Mike. Thank you, Chris Shearer. All right. Well, again, thanks to both of you as well. This has been the SBE Web Extra, the SBE chapter of the web. We present this monthly and we hope you'll join us each time. We'll post the replay on our YouTube channel, usually within a day. The SBE Web Extra is sponsored by Catrine, whom we thank for the support. Catrine, unique experience, individual solutions, reliable performance. If you hold SBE certification, viewing the SBE Web Extra qualifies you for one half point in category G, just like attending a local chapter meeting. And that does it for this installment of the SBE Web Extra from the Society of Broadcast Engineers, the Association for Broadcast and Multimedia Technology Professionals. Thanks once again to our guest, Michael Kronk, and on behalf of Kirk Harnack, we'll see you next month. <laughs>